afternoon, everyone. Thanks ever so much for coming. You know what it's like when you invite everyone to a party in five minutes before. I bought all this booze and no one's going to come, are they? So I really appreciate you coming. It's lovely. I'm Paul on the Town Park, the Town Council, and it's, uh, it's my pleasure to organise this for you this evening. Um, it, it's an interesting one because we've got unitary council elections and we have the town council elections that actually one more accepted. There were no town council candidates um, exceeding the number of seats available. So the independent for Froome group was elected uncontested to all but the Berkeley Downing. And we have uh, Anita Fonier here uh, who is standing in the Berkeley Down Ward to answer any questions in that area. Um, what we have on the stage, or who we have on the stage, is a candidate from each party. Um, as a lot of you will know, there are three divisions at Unitary level being contested. Uh, the candidates will represent all of the other candidates in their party. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a traditional question time event. Thanks to all of you who have already put your questions in. If we run out of questions and we've still got time, there will be an opportunity to ask that, or if we do run out of time, there, there's a box at the back. Uh, I think um, Myers is sitting in the hall outside the, outside the double doors. If you'd like to make sure that question is asked and you, you weren't able to ask it tonight, pop the question in there and we'll ensure that all the candidates get that. Um, so yeah, we're delighted to welcome all the candidates uh, and to keep everyone in order this evening. We're really lucky to have Emma Reynolds, the principal of Froome College, to hold the fort and make sure no one swears, no one goes over time and keep us all ship -shape. So over to you, Emma. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to chair uh, this meeting. So I'm just going to remind everybody this is a public meeting and as such, uh, any offensive language or behaviour will of course not be tolerated. So I'm going to first of all introduce you to the candidates who are going to smile and wave. So we're doing this alphabetically. So our first candidate is Martin Dimery, unitary candidate for Froome Rest on behalf of the Greens. Yeah. Number two, we've got Janine Nash, unitary candidate for Froome East on behalf of the Lib Dems. We have Steve Tanner, unitary candidate for Froome North on behalf of the Independents for Froome. And we have Byron Taylor, unitary candidate for Froome Rest on behalf of Labour. And we have Anita Collier, who is the uh, candidate on behalf of the Independence of Froome for Barclay Dunn. Thank you very much. So I'm going to invite each uh, representative to speak for two minutes um, of our time this afternoon. So to give a very brief overview um, of uh, what they represent and I'm going to ask all of the candidates to make sure that we have our eyes on the timekeeper in the front here. Um, so Peter is going to give you uh, the timings, we're going to tell you when you've got one minute left and when you've got 30 seconds left and we are keeping to time this afternoon please, mm -hmm. so can I remind everybody of that. So I'm going to invite first of all Martin Dimery, unitary candidate for free rest on behalf of the Greens to speak. Over to you Martin. Thank you very much. Um, in 2017, Somerset County elections, John Clark and I won two of the three Froome area seats for the Green Party. In 2019, the number of Green councillors increased or mended from three to ten. In that time, Green councillors have successfully proposed the declaration of a climate emergency, a policy on banning single-use plastics, and ensure public consultations against library closures Shore Start closures, centre closures, and that a COVID test and trace centre happened here in Froome, not just in Taunton, Shepton, Mallet, or Street. We have worked with the town and parishes to bring money for important environmental infrastructure projects and to support local charities carrying out ever more essential work in the community. When the deeply flawed ACORN application for Saxon Vale came before planning, only the Green councillors have consistently stood with Froome Town Council and voted against it. It was only the Green councillors who have spoken against the reopening of the Westover Quarry, which threatens catastrophic ecological destruction in return for only six jobs. 
in a national political climate which is corrupt, incompetent and utterly degenerate, we offer the politics not of conflict but collaboration, cooperation and consensus. This election in Somerset is too close to call. With a record number of Green candidates standing, we can hold the balance of power and also hold the majority on the promised Froome Area Planning Board and Local Community Network. In the future, it could be Green councillors making decisions on issues like Saxon Vale. On May the 5th, keep Froome green and let us lead the way on Somerset. Thank you. <laughs> Now I'm going to invite Janine Nash, the unitary candidate for Froome East, on behalf of the Lib Dems, to speak. Thank you. Um, I was elected in 2019 into Berkeley Down, and it's been my absolute privilege to represent that community in this town. In that time, I've worked with residents to help them get their voices heard, to give them empowerment to get their uh, opinions heard, and um, I've helped with securing green spaces or trying to secure green spaces. Um, I collaborated very well with Greens. I am currently chair of the Institute of Working Group for Climate Change, um, the constituents of which are mostly my colleagues in the Green Party, who we work very well with and have collaborated many times with. I too have sat at Planning Board and I have been one of the members of the Planning Board who did vote against the last iteration of the April Dwelling Application. And we too, as the Lib Dems have made it, have also stood against the reopening of the West Coast uh, the West uh, Quarry. Um, we wrote at the time to say that we didn't approve it and we are continuing to actively work against the reopening um, and so we're working with the Greens there too to help them. The reason I want to start again for you Tree is because there's an opportunity here to continue collaboration with our colleagues and to work better and I'd like the opportunity to be part of the new unitary to make it better, to represent through and to ensure that local um, politics are well represented in Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Okay, next I invite Steve Tanner to speak, the unitary candidate for Froome North on behalf of the Independents for Froome. You don't have to stand up. I'll stand. stay seated. Um, um, national party politics has dominated, undermined the efficiency and effectiveness of the Somerset Council for too long. I know from my own experience leading Froome Town Council's planning committee just how detrimental this can be to our communities. I'm running for unity because I believe there is a real opportunity for change and the chance for local people to have a genuine say in how things are done in their local area. I want to fight for this change and give a voice to the interests, ideas and needs of the people who live right here in Froome and the villages surrounding. People often ask why are IFF standing um, at unitary level um, and we are standing against something. We're not, we're standing for things. We're standing for five really clear reasons. To promote localism, we want to be a strong voice at county level, not just to, to secure a fair deal for Froome, um, but to make the case for potential localism to help build a better sunset. Um, we believe in responsible devolution. The new council is pledged to consider the devolution of assets and services to town and parish level, but we need a clear voice that says one size does not fit all. Um, the useful local community networks, we believe that we, we will have a very strong say in how those are run and that is going to shape the future. Um, we know very little about specific geography, budgets or powers, um, but they could be powerful gatherings. Um, rational decision making, um, the foundation of the way we work as a group of people is swayed and learning is not made dogma on ideology. And finally we want to create a better council, not just a bigger council. There is so much innovation at local level across Somerset and the challenges that the new council will face are huge. We believe we'll be too ambitious to take advantage of the new county deals that are currently being piloted. Thank you very much.
now I'm going to invite Myron Tyler to speak, the unitary, unitary candidate for Froome West on behalf of Labour. Hello everybody. Um, I'm aware that many of you haven't met me before, so I think some introductions are probably in order. Byron Taylor, I've lived in Froome for three years, and I think that I can bring what it takes to Froome to help us deliver a right, the right deal for Froome. So, just a little bit about me. I was all the trade union officer. I'm used to fighting for what we need to get. I'm used to fighting for people and forcing, to, forcing, our, uh, forcing the council to listen to what we want from Fort Broome. In terms of my experience, I am the former leader of the Labour Council on Basildon. I have experience. My priorities are quite clear. Housing, services, climate. And let's be clear, in each of those areas, I can bring something to Froome. In housing, I have set up a council housing board in order to ensure that we can deliver the council houses we need for those people who can't afford proper accommodation in Froome. On services, I've worked hard, I've done community asset transfers, I've ensured that the, I've ensured that the assets which reside in the town belong to the people of the town, whether it's playing fields or other assets, like this very building we stand in the cheese and grain. This should be a community asset in Froome. In terms of the climate, I've done the climate emergency. I introduced that policy into Basildon. I've pushed hard for solar panels, retrofitting, decarbonisation. These are things that I can bring to Froome, and these are things that I can help with you. But most importantly, with the change in the local government arrangements, we have the opportunity to transfer assets and power back to Froome. And I believe that I can bring this, these skills to bear for free in the coming weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Barry. Okay, thank you very much to all of the candidates. We're now going to the questions, so thank you very much to everybody who has submitted uh, questions from the public. We have them in order. So I'm going to introduce the, uh, people by name. You'll be asked to, just to, uh, to, to um, ask just one question, please. Even if you've submitted two, you're only to ask one question, please. And each of the candidates has one minute to respond. We're going to follow alphabetically in exactly the same way. And we're looking for succinct and clear answers, please, this afternoon. So first of all, um, I welcome Lawrence Elton. Lawrence? Thank you, Lawrence. You'll be asking the first question. Over to you. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am sort of wearing my heart upon my sleeve here, but and the question has been partially covered by some of the candidates, but could everybody give me their specific feelings about Saxon Vale? I mean, there is a local project to run the Mayday scheme, run by the people who actually are in the area. Well, there's Acorn, which seems to be the uh, big business uh, function of it. I think what each of you people on the table to give their answers to my question. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Martin. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm not on planning, I'm not on many district councilmen on Somerset, so I don't have to deal with it. I can speak pretty freely. I didn't particularly like the ACORN um, application from the very beginning. Uh, I, I don't like the way the road wheels its way through a housing estate in order to get articulated lorries at the back of supermarkets. Um, I think uh, initially they came up with a, a workable option um, which they then was then distracted from by the, by the times it's been reviewed, so that we now have five-storey blocks of flats rather than three-storey blocks of flats in some parts. And uh, I much prefer the uh, the May Day option because it looks to be doing something for the community, and um, and it's not for profit organisation. It, it brings in more resources into the town and not just unaffordable housing. And certainly, like the fact that the and the affordable housing uh, element has been dropped considerably by Thank you very much, Jim. And this is the only thing that we think is brilliant that we actually have the option and that we have two on the table to choose from. How fantastic is that given the amount of time that it's been empty and um, underdeveloped? So um, I think that there are there's a situation that's happened whereby there was only one game in town. Thank you. 
Thank you. Steve? Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, something must happen with that site. It's been derelict for decades. Um, from the town council's perspective and from my own personal perspective, the Mayday proposition is much better for the town and they've got a great team behind it. So yes, we absolutely back it. Um, they support us and we support them. Um, uh, I know there's been something over, I think, 1,500 people who have offered support for Mayday Saxonville, which is unprecedented against 500 against for Acorn. So the town is speaking, really. Um, at the end of the day, one project is community driven and for the people and the other one is profit driven and for the developer. Um, that's why we're for Mayday. Thank you. And Byron. Yeah, I mean, I'll be absolutely clear. I'm in favour of the Mayday proposal. Um, I think it's quite outrageous the way that the Mayday proposal was dismissed by the Leader of Mendip Council. I thought it was a salutary lesson in the problems that we have with planning. And it's one of the areas when I talk about localism, how planning should be devolved back to the town council as far as possible to ensure that the voice of people is heard rather than Mendip Council or indeed Somerset County Council. But the other thing to say is that I've looked at the Mayday proposal and I've looked at the affordable housing requirement. And for me, one of my real questions around the whole of Saxondale is, do we have enough social rent, uh, social rent housing within the development? Mayday is a substantial improvement on the ACORN proposal that was put forward by amended council. But let's be clear, when it's £1,200 to rent a three-bed house in Froome, we have a problem that we have to sort out. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I invite Roger Saunders to ask his question on housing, please. Roger. Thank you. Thank you. With hundreds of Froome people forced to live in inadequate, unaffordable housing or to move away, how would you use your powers as a Somerset County Councillor to help the many local people in serious housing need? Thank you. Martin? Yeah, one thing I think we can look towards, and I think Somerset's beginning to look towards this now, is we must start building social housing again. It's vitally important, and we must have allocations of social housing in all the housing developments that may go forward in through. Um, I think social housing as well is better when it's mixed with private housing. Uh, I don't want to return to the days when uh, estates, council estates grew up in the 60s, 60s, 70s, and the 50s maybe, that became sinking estates because they, they simply weren't adequately built and they weren't thought out properly. Um, so we, we need to do that and more affordable housing as well. We must stick to uh, the regulation that affordable housing must provide, must be provided by the developers. Too often it's been allowed to slip back. Thank you. Janine? Um, I would say that it's a multi-pronged approach and uh, there's a number of factors that, that dictate how we deal with this. Um, first and foremost is to address the quality of the housing that people are currently living in and to make sure that social landlords are brought to bear to make sure that they are actually adhering to legal and adequate safe housing standards. That's absolutely critical. We need to work with what we've got. Secondly, we do need to, as Martin has said, hold developers uh, to, to their promises and make sure that the right amount of housing is actually put in developments. In, not in silos, mixed, that's also important. We need to also uh, work with our partners in Fair Housing for Froome, the Community Land Trust, and our partners in Froome Town Council to make sure that we're using brownfield sites where possible and that we're building the right housing, good quality, climate conscious housing in the right place. Thank you. Steve? Um, sort of agree with everything that's been said really. I think you know, we, the 30% is, is a minimum, not a maximum. The developers see it as a maximum. It needs to be a minimum. I think actually in somewhere like Froome, we should probably insist on something nearer to 40%. They're doing it in Wells. There's no reason why it shouldn't happen in Froome. Um, all developments need to be driven by the, the needs of the area and not by the profit of the developer. Um, and as Jeanine said, I think we need to work closely with people like FACOL, with people like Fairhouse and Froome, Home Share Mendip, 
you know, the, the, the stigma of, of social housing, affordable housing is poor quality, stuck at the edge of a development next to a road or a railway line. It's got to be pepper potted, it's got to be integrated into a development so that they are nice places where people want to live and they form part of a community, not an afterthought of the edge. Thank you. And Byron? The critical word in your question is power. And the problem is that for too long, it's been about power and money. And how should Somerset County Councillors use that power? Because what's happening is that we are selling land to developers and then relying on developers to give us the homes that we actually need. And that is wrong absolutely wrong. What needs to happen here is that we need a council house cooperative or some such which actually acts as developer so we can create the homes that we need and stop putting our, not stop putting our land into the hands of private developers. And let's be clear, social rents are hugely important because Mendip and the County Council talk about affordable rents. That's 80% of market value, that's a thousand pounds a month for a three bed home. We need to stop putting our trust in developers and start doing it ourselves because we have the power to do so. Thank you, Barry. Okay. Currently, a uh, question from the floor. Um, how will new councillors support homeless people in our community? Can I invite Martin's response, please? I think that the answer to that partly is with... Um, in, in, in what we just said about the provision of homes, so I won't repeat that bit, but also working with social services to try and deal with the issue of homelessness. It's usually behind every homeless person there is a background which needs, which needs sorting out, which needs addressing uh, where they can get counselling and where their issues can be dealt with. And we've seen a, a, a decline in uh, our, the provision of social services through endless cuts over the last few years and we need to retain our social workers and we need to retain our offices for dealing with those those issues as well and it is yes it's a question of money thank you Janine um, I agree with much of Martin has said I think there is something to be said for um, supporting the citizens advice bureau more to provide more help to people and there's a big part in preventing homelessness in the first place that we need to be addressing. There's also mental health issues and help advocates to keep people in their housing when some people are finding it difficult to actually maintain the upkeep of their, the housing that they're in, maintaining their rent, paying their bills. I think there's a lot to be said for getting in there and supporting people to stay where they are and avoiding them then finding themselves on the street in the first place. We have Thanks to some of my previous colleagues, I understand working with Froome Town Council got a homeless shelter here in Froome. Um, that's the worst case scenario, but at least we have a place where people can find safety and warmth. And I just think we need to work better with the community and social housing and mental health to try and help people where we can. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I to echo what's been said, I think there's lots of groups in Froome that are really trying to tackle this issue and I think we need to bring all the groups together, FACOL, Fair Housing for Froome, um, the, the debt provision, the citizens and rights against debt, um, to bring everyone together to actually look and get some really hard data about the homeless situation that exists in Froome. We know about the street homeless but there's a whole raft of, of sofa surfers that we really do need some, some really good data and from there I think we can look to solve or try to solve the problem. Thank you. Byron. Um, Froome's got a heart, hasn't it? And we don't like seeing people homeless. And that's one of the reasons I live here, because I like Froome. But the reality is that since 2010, your council tax bills have been increased by 26%, yet social services has been absolutely gutted. That is the root cause of homelessness, because we do not have the support network in place. I work in the homeless shelters every Christmas, and I see the stories that come through. If we want to tackle homelessness, yes, we need all of those agencies to work together in Froome. Yes, we need to have a joined up approach, but let's be clear, we are dealing with the symptoms of a problem and we need to tackle with the root cause. And the root cause starts with your Somerset County councillors 
looking at social services, making sure the resources are being used effectively and in the right places, and having the housing supply in order to meet that need. We can deal with the symptoms, we've got to deal with the cause. Thank you very much, thank you. <coughs> and I now invite Nick Sharp to ask his question on corruption. Nick? Is Nick here? Are you here, Nick? Okay, I shall ask Nick's question. Nick, before you do it, might you, could, could we ask sort of reverse the answering order? To yes. Start with, give, give Martin a bit of a break. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to do the other way around. Right, Nick Sharp's question, what will the candidates do to address the corruption and law-breaking on the council? So over to you, Byron. Okay, <coughs> so I haven't been on the council. I mean, I've read the reports, as other people have, but that's why we have standards committees on local council. Now, I was a leading councillor for four years in Basildon, never once had a stand complaints against me, and quite frankly, it should be really straightforward to stay on the right side of a standards committee. Um, what we need to see and ensure is that councils are living up to the Nolan principles, set out by the Committee in Standards in Public Life to ensure that all, all councillors understand their duties and responsibilities. But, I believe that the best thing and the best way of dealing with issues is to look at, is to look at, where dealing with such issues is the, to have the light of transparency. And I believe all council decision processes should be open and democratic so that people can see what needs to be done. Thank you. Steve? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously public confidence is low at the moment. The Prime Minister seems to be leading the way um, in, uh, in, in that. And, you know, we, we do need full transparency. Uh, I haven't been on a county council, but I know there are uh, monitoring situations. There are um, various bodies that people can refer to if there are uh, um, corruption or if they feel that there is corruption. So, um, yeah, we know there are isolated incidents and, um, and there has to be a mechanism for those incidents to be reported and acted on in an open, transparent way. Thank you. Janine? I think there is always an issue for the public if they don't understand how the council works, um, that there is a perception of things happening. And I think my advice in that case is that there are several approaches you can take. One, you can approach your monitoring officer at your local council and your chief exec and have them do an internal investigation. If you're not then satisfied there, you go to the local government office. If you actually have evidence that you think that there is criminal behaviour or um, improper dealings within your council, then the right authorities to go to would be the police and the local government association, who will then carry out a proper investigation to find out what's happening if indeed there is. Thank you. Martin. I, I'm sorry that the person who asked that question isn't here because I, I'd like to know if they have a specific case in mind. I think there is an assumption that the, the corruption is endemic in local government and I have to tell you I, I've not found that to be the case. When one becomes a councillor, the, one of the first things that happens is you, you sit down with the county solicitor or the, the, the district solicitor in the case who reads out the rules and regulations to you. And actually, I mean, let's, for example, say we deal with PPE, for example, if we did, and, um, for example, I said that my local um, hotelier or bar manager uh, could have a contract, um, or my sister have a contract, I think I'd be in very serious trouble, uh, I'd be suspended, there would be an inquiry, I'd be kicked out, I might even be prosecuted. I don't know why that doesn't happen in Parliament, frankly. <laughs> Uh, Sean, Sean Dreamgill to ask his question about overall control. Sean? Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Um, I think the legislation was originally called, in fact, we're assuming that there's been a weird process. Um, things have changed somewhat in the last couple of months. And it may now very well be the case that Somerset County Council has no overall control. Maybe the services don't do quite as well, but the Jones will look better. Neither have a majority. In that case, I'd like to ask each of the candidates which parties would you work with and which parties would you not work with? Thank you. Byron, let's start with you. Yeah, well, to be honest, I don't want to work with the Conservative Party. I never have done. I don't trust them. I see what they've done to our county and I see what they've done to our country. 
But the reality is, in a period of no overall control, there are great opportunities for a town like Froome to secure the deal that it needs. As we go through this transition, as we see the dissolution of Mendip and the creation of the Unitary Authority, there is an opportunity for councillors from Froome to make the case for the community, to actually ensure that things like the transfer of assets or services are the best they can be and are, are working in the interests of the people of Froome. And if elected, I pledge to use that position as a councillor for Froome to get the best deal I can from Froome out of whatever administration is trying to form. Because at the end of the day, if a council of Tetsu and said to me, if you support us on the budget, we will transfer the cheese and grain to the town council. Hell yeah, I'll jump at it. Thank you. Steve? Um, I think everyone knows that, you know, if we have a, we've always had a close relationship with the Greens, I see no reason that that won't continue. Um, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're looking to, to, to do things for Froome and, and for the villages. If, if any of the other parties comes up with a, with a really good practical idea, then, then we, we, would, we would support it. I mean, we know in the past who has come up with those ideas and which of those parties um, we're likely to get on, on side with. And things like, you know, the bus routes in and around the local villages um, from Froome and transportation. All those sort of things, yeah, we're, we're, we're very happy to sit down and talk with, with all the different parties about that to form a consensus and get some action going. Thank you. Janine? Um, again, I think it, it depends on the makeup of what happens when we get there. Um, certainly, we would be happy to work with the Greens and with the Independents and with Labour. Um, the reality of the situation is, is that I'm prepared to, to work with anyone who is a good, solid candidate who is invested in representing their community for the best benefit of the room. And if they have integrity and they're honest and they're full of good ideas and full of enthusiasm, I'm happy to work with them. Thank you. And Martin? Well, the reality is, I mean, um, if any of us climb into bed with the Conservative Party at the moment, we're finished, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, they, they haven't even sent a representative. They haven't even sent a representative here today. And that's what we're hearing on the doorstep. So um, you'll be surprised at the suggestions that have been going on in the smoke-filled rooms in County Hall. That I've, I've been involved in a number of discussions about what might well happen if there's a, a change in the balance of power. Well, I'd very much like to work with Sean who asked the question because he's coming from a Labour perspective and we do work well in opposition with the Labour Party and with the Liberal Democrats. I don't think, I think it will depend on numbers and statistics. But let me just say this, you don't have to go. You don't have to be in with another party. You don't have to collaborate or with another party if you don't want to. Actually holding the balance of power would be a very powerful thing. And then you can, and you can vote whichever, whichever way you think is right, rather than following the party whip. And in the Green Party, we don't have a party whip. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, this question is from a member of the public, a school question. What are your views on the sale of the school field site at Pack Saddle, which has been owned by Somerset County Council for 50 years as a school, and is this a suitable site for 90 homes? So we're going to start, please, with Byron. Okay, so the Pax Saddle proposal, as I understand it, sits outside the development boundary. Um, and so well, that's on that basis warrants close examination. My concern is that we will have stones that extend out to the Spring Gardens and I'll close that patch of green space. Now, don't get me wrong, I should stick by what I said earlier. Absolutely, we have to think about houses and we have to think about affordable houses for the people of Froome. The proposal of Pack Sale 90 homes is a lot on that site, and the affordable home and the affordable criteria for that at 30% is just not simply enough. So yes, I'm minded to agree with the proposal, but I think it needs to be looked at in a lot more detail before we say yes, that's a suitable site for that amount. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, again, a previous response, you know, about affordable housing and and how to build. I mean, it, it is a site that's been earmarked for development. Um, Somerset County Council said that they don't need it for a school, therefore it, it, it would warrant um, looking at very closely for development. Um, I strongly believe that any development has to fit within the local community that it's going to be in, and the type of houses, the style of development, uh, the green spaces, um, it should form part of the community that it's going to sit in, not just be a bolt-on, not just be an add-on to the side. 
So, uh, yeah, it, it needs looking at very, very closely as it's outside the boundary area, but I think that's a discussion worth having. Thank you. Janine? Um, may I defer to Adam Boyden, who has been actively involved in this matter? Um, if you speak from there, that's fine. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's in my interest. I think that's on there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Alan Boyd, and so my uh, current district ward is the, the perhaps have a field site lies in. Uh, the sale was announced uh, in March by the Conservative led uh, Somerset County Council. Is it a suitable site? Well, I don't know, is the answer. It hasn't been assessed. Hasn't been assessed under the sustainability appraisal as yet uh, in any local plan context. It hasn't been discussed at a public meeting. It was discussed and agreed the, the sale behind closed doors. That's not very true, I don't think. Uh, the, the site has uh, some mature trees, uh, historic bound, historic uh, hedgerows and walls. It's much loved by the local community. I know several people here live, live around it and walk the fields regularly. So there's many reasons why it shouldn't be uh, suitable to, to develop that many houses. Uh, as I found out from Midwest, that's what they're thinking of at least. They need to do a constraints analysis. They need to put forward proposals. Then we can see what they're proposing and see what we think of it. But also, it needs to be discussed in public as to whether this is a suitable site to develop, and it hasn't been done yet. Thank you very much. And Martin? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, speaking personally, um, I, I walk my dog around there for years, and uh, my daughter's dog now, and uh, I don't want it to be built on, but that's not really a good reason for uh, turning down planning. Um, it needs to be looked at thoroughly. Um, that land was designated to be a school, and I think that was always the case on Pax Apple, and so people who uh, live uh, uh, adjoining that will have known through their deeds that some building was, some development was likely to happen. Um, so I certainly would want to see, I certainly wouldn't want to see 90 houses on it. That seems extraordinary, but we're seeing this all the time, aren't we, with developers um, going for huge numbers of houses and then climbing back and climbing down. And we have to judge every um, application I don't, but other people have to judge them by their merits. And if eventually it comes to county, I will do that. Um, we need more housing. That doesn't mean to say I will support housing being built there. Thank you very much. And I invite uh, Tricia, Tricia Galinsky, uh, to ask her question, which is on housing developments. Tricia? Um, thank you. It's a bit similar to the last question. What are your views on proposed housing developments outside the housing boundary? Okay, we're going to start the order differently. So, Janine, over to you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think I would rather uh, that we dealt with the available sites within our boundaries to begin with and um, as in the local plan and work out what we're doing with them as a priority. It would be my preference for them to be developed way before we're looking at anything outside the development boundary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin. Uh, Trisha, are you referring to Master Lane in particular? Not or Selwood Garden community? Yeah. Um, Selwood Garden community is in the Selwood Parish. There's a lot of responsibility for a parish council to, to adjust to. I've been to many of the meetings. I think there's a, a level of acceptance that something will happen there. I think the, the, the real problem for me is it's such a huge proposal that I can see it being divided up. I have no reassurances that that land won't be being divided up. Therefore, the question is, if you're going to put a doctor's there, who builds the doctor's? If you're going to put a school there, who builds, builds the school? These questions haven't been answered. So I think it's possible to build outside of the boundary, but again, you have to judge each planning application within its merits. I think the people in Selwood Parish broadly have accepted something will happen there, but hopefully not on this scale that we're talking about. Thank you. Byron? Yes. And we're kind of lapsing back into the is these suitable housing developments, are they the right thing, you know, you know, is it the right place to have a housing development? Um, our, my point about the development boundary still stands, you have a development boundary for a reason, we should be looking at proposals of bin those. But at the end of the day, it's the same as the PAC Saddle site, we are selling our land off to developers. And once it's with the developers, we then struggle to control exactly what's going on that site. And for me, the question is, why can't we do this ourselves? Why can't we, as a community, be in control of the building that we need to make happen in this town to provide for the future of our children? 
And that is a really critical point because I believe that the people of Froome are far better than anyone in Taunton, Yeovil or the private sector to determine actually what we need here in Froome. So. Thank you. Steve? Um, yes, the, we, we should be standing within the local boundary um, and, and, and building what's in the local boundary first. Anyone, that, that's absolutely clear. Um, we've seen two developments come to planning uh, from town council planning in the last month both of which are probably one of the worst i've ever seen quite frankly they're speculative they bring nothing to the community they bring nothing to the town at all it's just a money-making scheme for developers and we should throw them out completely um, you know we, we just we just have to do what's in the boundary first fill that up Otherwise, we're going to have all kinds of traffic issues, and you know, let's let, let's just look after the town, basically. Thank you very much. And now I invite Rose Rose Haywood to ask her question about pavements and pedestrians, please. Um, I'm very concerned about the infrastructure that is going to be um, looked at when all this housing is um, put forward. Take for example um, a little street like Vicarage Street. It's now um, a rat run linking the town centre and local main roads. But it has a volume and weight of traffic for which it was never built. The, it only has one pavement, and that pavement is being used as a relief hard shoulder so that the um, traffic, which includes HGVs, to pass each other. And I have seen pedestrians pushed aside, and I have had my arm bashed by a wing mirror of a vehicle wanting to get past me when I was on the pavement. So when are you going to do something about pavements for people? Thank you. Janine, over to you. I think the answer to that question is quite difficult and I think that's going to be something that needs to be addressed almost immediately with highways um, as and when um, we get there. Um, I think there's it's an important exercise that we should be in communication with the community, identifying places that are hazardous and working on some kind of joined up approach to make sure that we can make these places safer and that we can redirect and have proper traffic studies where necessary. I think that it's not an easy question to answer in this forum until we know the extent of the problem, but it needs to be dealt with certainly. And if you have places that you would like to report, please report them, tell us where they are, and we can raise the issue and we can start consulting with you to work with you to solve the problem. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, I think um, with regard to the uh, Vicarage Street, I want to see uh, any Saxon Vale development ensure that there's a one-way system there so the traffic isn't passing, so it goes round in a circuit rather than passing. I don't think we can avoid traffic um, articulated lorries sort of going round there, unfortunately, because it's a service and access area. But your point is very well made. In general, with uh, pavements and roads, um, you can you can go on amend my street site or look it up on the internet. Um, I advise you to do that because I don't I don't find phoning County Hall very good actually myself. So I advise you to do that or, or get in touch with with us if you have a problem with pavements. One of your councillors, it's a county council thing. One of, the pay, the one of your councillors should be able to deal with that. So do get in touch if it's a specific thing. In the long plan, very difficult. Roads and pavements eat up huge amounts of money. Thank you. Byron. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that it shouldn't be that difficult to sort out. Um, it's a clear safety issue, and that is a priority for the council. So 
Um, I mean, come and speak to me afterwards. I'm happy to put a letter in. I think that's wrong, quite frankly. And we need to be looked at. And for me, we have a town which is, we're trying to create a green community. <coughs> at the end of the day, we need to make sure that pedestrians have priority and pedestrians are safe. And I think all of these issues need to be looked at locally. And the place to do that is on the town council with the support of Somerset County Council, with councillors who will speak up for free. That's really important, and if elected, that's how I would intend to work. But let's be clear, if there is a safety issue, that needs to be dealt with now. Thank you. And Steve? Yeah, this is one of the, uh, one of the reasons why Independence for Froome are standing at a unitary level. Um, it has been so frustrating for us over the years. Whenever we want to get something done on the streets of Froome, it's who do we talk to? Do we talk to Mendip? Do we talk to Somerset? We're passed from pillar to post when we can't get anything done. When the local community networks are set up, we want to see that power devolved and the budget devolved so we can do these things ourselves because we've proved that we can do it far, far quicker than Mendip or Somerset ever can. Okay, thank you very much. Now I invite Susie, Susie Temple to ask her question about climate emergency, please. Hi, I'm Susie and I'm here representing Freedom Families for Future. We're a group of parents who are extremely concerned about the climate crisis and the impact that is going to have on our children and on future generations. So um, I think the first part, the question is pretty easy, which would be, would you declare a climate emergency? But also interested to hear um, how you would go about combating the climate crisis as a councillor. Thank you, Susie. Over to you first, Janine, please. Thank you. Thank you for your question, it's really important. Firstly, I would say that Mendip has declared a climate emergency. I believe that County also has declared a climate emergency. So that's already been done. Um, in advance of the unitary formation, there is a cross-district group, a Somerset-wide strategy that has been agreed on by all of the districts that will be moving into the mean unitary. Um, and that is a carbon uh, management plan that is designed to um, keep us on track to carbon neutrality. There is a cross district group already working on um, pulling all of the districts together so that by the time we hit unitary we have a better joined up approach. We have just been recognised, um, two of the districts within our current um, and the county have all been recognised by an organisation for the efforts that we've made and the policies that we've put in place in respect of the climate. Thank and we're you. working really, really hard to make sure that we live up to those expectations going forwards. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin. Yeah, um, we do have a bit of climate emergency strategy um, and things are getting done, but sometimes I'm quite surprised at the things that are getting done at county level because I, I tend to read about them in um, press releases rather than actually being on committees that decide them. I think we badly need to bring all these aspects together because some of the climate uh, strategies are based in different departments. And so what we're proposing is, is we want to see a climate scrutiny panel that actually understands what's going on and can bring different departments together so that we can be sure that we have more tree planting. I'd like to see more solar solar farms because, or so, solar energy being um, being installed because uh, actually you can actually make money from that. You know, you can save people money from it. I'd like to see the council being involved with more car charging points in their car parks. Again, it's something that gives a return. We don't have to pay all this money to the oil companies for petrol. We can put it into our, our parking uh, budget. Um, thank you. And we, we all, sorry, is that it? Yep, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, Byron. Yeah, um, we're not going fast enough on any of the climate emergency. And yes, I have been in the position of declaring a climate emergency on a local authority. And actually, you have to think really broadly about what you're trying to achieve and how quickly you can achieve it. Because I understand the current target in Somerset is 2030 for net zero, which is a long way off. And actually, we need to move much more quicker. We need to think about walking routes. We need to think about cycling routes. We need to think about deinvesting the pension fund from fossil fuels. We need to think about renewables. Mendip has agreed to put six EV points in through. That's 1.5 places for every year of a Liberal Democrat administration. 
that is not moving quick enough. Actually, the Somerset County Council has a role to play, and we should be looking at things like social housing and how we, re how we retrofit solar panels and how we retrofit insulation onto the properties that we control. And we should be offering private Thank landlords the support to achieve that. Thank you. Steve. Um, I think Froome is already leading the way on, on, on climate change. We're, we're doing so much work. We, were the, we, we, we put a supplementary planning document together, which I think Mendip have copied, um, that's trying to get developers to build to carbon neutral. Um, we intend to push that forward. Um, local cycling and walking infrastructure plans that we've put in place. Um, we've, uh, the, the, the share shop, recycling, um, energy saving, the, we're working with the Centre for Sustainable Energy, um, promotion of e-bikes, um, promotion of e-cars, um, yeah, look, we, we're looking to do as much as we possibly can, it's never enough, um, we, we, we want to really push for the, the, the target of 2030 to be net zero. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, final two questions, the first of which is from Karen Churchill from the floor please. Thank you, Karen. It's in, thank you. So we're going to start with Steve for these first two questions. So. The government's safety guidelines for wireless radiation is industry biased, totally inadequate. Will councillors promote safe technology and commit to protect the environment and from residents from increasing electro smog, especially from 5G? And will 5G be included in the climate scrutiny panel as 5G is not carbon neutral? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Steve? Um, thank you. Um, we've discussed 5G at length um, at a town council level. I am dare say it will be at unitary level as well. Um, we've looked at both sides and uh, it really is panels of experts that we need. Um, one of the things that we could consider is, is to set up a panel here in Froome to get the industry specialists, to get the, uh, the, all sides of the argument together to have a proper discussion on 5G um, and, and to really understand the issues because I think it's way beyond a lot of us' is, uh, um, experience and a lot of us is to, to understand what it actually means. Um, there is always two sides to the 5G argument. I think it's important that we listen to both sides. Thank you. Byron. Yeah, this is an issue I've dealt with before, and the issue of fine masks and what impact they have on the residents. And I've actually been through this process of calling together industry experts and um, uh, think tanks and people from academia to look at the issue. The short answer is that no one's actually sure what the impact is, and no one can give you a definitive answer of what the installation will be. So my attitude with these things is always tread carefully and think about the potential impact on people. That does not mean that you say no to new technology. That means that you tread carefully and think. And the worst example I've seen is a phone mask put right next to a school, and it's like, mm -hmm. hang on. Is that the right thing to do, really? Because in my perspective, that's not in the best interest of our children or the future. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, there needs to be a lot more research into 5G before we can start slamming at masts everywhere. And um, we also need to, to keep masts away generally from, from, as you were saying, school areas, but, but areas of uh, big urban areas, developed urban areas. There are other places they can go. Thank you. Thank you. And Janine. I think I echo actually um, the other panelists' views on on having an expert panel because it's important. When I, I mean I, I don't know everything about 5G and I'm not qualified to make that decision. Um, I would say that we need experts. We need a balanced view. I would also say that the recent planning application was turned down for the 5G masks. Um, and I can also say that I'm not entirely sure that when it comes to appeal that the government will uphold that decision. So there is always that risk that actually the bigger picture is how do we deal with the decisions further up the chain and prevent it from actually happening. Thank you very much. And our final question, I invite uh, John Warman, please. John Warman, do we have John here? Hello. Hi, John. Yes, to ask your question about green spaces. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, my question was really about key developments in Froome Town. The first part of which you have very capably dealt with, which is Mayday, Saxon Vale. 
and I'm sure that will give long-term residents and through a bit of a yawn. However, the development in the town is very crucial, I think. We've touched upon the building of new houses, we've touched upon them being in the right areas with the right density. My question is about the green spaces that have been identified during the recent consultations between Froome Town Council and Menlib District Council to transfer this land to Froome Town Council. What do the candidates actually feel they can do to ensure that these green important lungs of the town remain as such in perpetuity? Thank you very much John. So Steve, over to you. I think, um, I think everybody knows post-Covid how important um, the green spaces are um, to everybody and um, the Town Council will have started working with Mendip um, to try and transfer some of those over or at least identify them. Um, it's an exciting opportunity for us. Um, to control these green spaces at the end of the day. Um, it seems like a really good idea and it's, yes, it's something we really want to explore. Um, we are obviously conscious that we don't just want to uh, end up with a massive grab and end up with things that we can't, um, we can't sustain um, and we don't have the asset to sustain. But yes, I mean, we are, we are fully supportive of, of, of the green spaces. We're fully supportive of protecting those green spaces, um, not just for now, but for future generations. Thank you. Byron. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree in that green spaces are the lungs of a town. And um, I went through a very similar situation a few years ago where we had a community asset which was threatened with building upon. And it was absolutely vital to the local community. And we ensured that that was protected. We did a asset transfer to the community and we gave it fields in trust protection status, which means that in future we have protection in perpetuity for that piece of ground. So for me, that's really important. But let's be clear you've got the abolition of Mendip, Somerset County Council. There is an opportunity to return the assets that were taken from Froome Urban District Council, for those of you who remember that institution. <laughs> who were taken in 72, we have an opportunity to have those assets returned to us and the question is how can we secure those assets and how can we protect them going forward because yes, our parks, yes, some of our buildings, the car park outside of here, all of these things will pop belong to Froome and we need to make sure they come back. Thank you very much and Martin. Yeah, um, I think I said this on the Froome Councillors Forum, get them off Mendip as soon as you can and for God's sake don't let them go to Taunton. Thank you. One of the most yeah. important things in that respect is to get local community networks up and running and area planning boards. I don't want an area planning board at Chapter Mallet. I want an area planning board in Froome. And I want that those decisions to be made by Froome based councillors. Thank you. I'll finish now. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, Janine. Um, so some of this work is already in progress and we have been working, various um, town councillors and district councillors already have been working on, there is a list of assets that Froome Town Council have approached uh, the district for um, in advance of the county in order to try and wrest them from Mendip before the county happens. Um, so that is in progress and there are a variety of different options that have been proposed as to how the land might be held. So I would like to say that it is a work in progress, it is being looked at and if we haven't already covered your piece of land for goodness sake let us know where it is, contact us and we can discuss pushing that forwards too. Thank you. And I'm now going to invite Anita, Anita Kellier to respond to the question as well. Thank you Emma. Can I use this? Yeah, we, we've certainly already sent a list off to Mendip, uh, as people have said, and it's been a very, very long list. We've asked for every little green space we can think of around the town and put that forward as a possibility for Mendip to hand over before the, the uh, dissolution. I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, I've been involved personally on saving some of the green spaces when they were under threat. We all know how important they are for mental health. 
Uh, and I think certainly it's, we have to work very hard at taking not only the green spaces, but all the other assets that will work for Froome, as long as they can be used flexibly and they're for the community. Everything we do must be for the purpose of the community, that we can actually build those tighter communities that we're going to be needing in the future. Uh, we're going to go through some tough times soon. Uh, with an increase in fuel, with all the other cost of living issues that are coming up. And I think it's going to be even more important to salvage those green spaces uh, and to keep working on, on Fruma's behalf. Thank you very much, Nita. Thank you. And that concludes our questions and our presentation. So now, thank you very much for everybody for attending. We're now inviting you to meet either your ward councillor or your unitary candidate along the sides of the room. If you're unable to stay and you would like to ask any further questions, there is a box, I believe, Paul, at the back of the hall. Yeah at the back by the exit door to leave your questions and comments and we will send copies of that to the candidates and councillors. Thank you very much and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you.